Until further notice, we're sheltering in place here in California thanks to the COVID-19 coronavirus. Luckily, we've got answers to lots of your questions that we were able to record before all hell broke loose. So today on Your Money, Your Wealth, Steve in San Diego, Cole in your Hyundai Elantra, Shay in New York, David in Chicago, Chris in Texas, Margaret in Virginia, and Tennessee Dave and Sunil, your questions are being answered in this episode, and we're talking taxes. If you're in the 22% tax bracket, does 22% of what you make go to the IRS? How does capital gains tax work with the ordinary income tax? After that, it's all Roth conversions and contributions. And we'll wrap it up with a question about taxes and penalties if you take the 529 money and run. I'm producer Andy Last. We've got no Steve Miller here, but we do have the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. We got Steve. He writes in from San Diego. Hi, Joe and Al and Andy. Did you put that in, Andy? Nope. Steve does that because you say that every time. What, that you put it in parentheses? He, he adds it so that uh, I get I get kudos. There. Oh, I got it. Yeah. So props. Yep. I hope you get to stay on the radio as the show just keeps getting better and better. Oh, thanks, Steve. We get w- one more of those... One more one-star one star reviews versus five stars. We're, we're, we're being pulled. <laughs> yeah. So five stars were on, one stars were out. I'm just, just letting just, people know. Yep. Okay. I think we know. I think it would be helpful for you guys to go into some detail about income tax ladder structure. Up until recently, I thought that if your income goes into the next tax bracket, you have to pay the high rate on your whole income. A few months ago, I was listening to another radio show, and they mentioned that only the amount in each bracket gets taxed at the bracket's rate. Is this correct? Why are you cheating on us, Steve? Because <laughs> we're not talking about this. Because you're not on 24 hours a day. He's got to listen to something else on the radio. It's just heartbreaking. Could you break down the detail of the tax structure of the brackets for those um, who make, let's say, 50000 to $200,000 annually? Thanks. Um, that's kind of a big gap, Steve, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could make fifty, or I could make two hundred. Yeah. Let's say I made fifty. Okay. Let's say I made a two hundred. All right. So, are you uh, Steve single? Do we know if Steve single or if he's married? I don't know that. Mm, okay. Yeah. So I will go. I'll just go single. All right. Since that's the first one I got in front of me. So the single bracket, uh, the ten percent bracket, goes to nine thousand eight hundred seventy-five. By the way, that's taxable income. Taxable income. Line ten on your tax yeah, return. It's, it's not gross income. It's after your standard deduction or itemized deduction, whichever is higher. So ten thousand dollars, line ten, taxable income. Anything under that, right? So let's say if you made thirty thousand dollars, but your taxable income's ten, twenty thousand is non-taxable. Okay, that's right. And so the the ten thousand dollars is going to be taxed at the ten percent rate. Yeah, pr- pretty much nine thousand eight hundred seventy five okay. is taxed at ten percent, and one hundred twenty five dollars is taxed at twelve percent. And so that's his question. It's like, what if I go a dollar over into the next bracket? Is the whole thing taxed at the higher bracket? The answer is no. It's just the extra amount or the incremental amount or the what, whatever went over into the next bracket. That gets taxed at a higher amount. And I do think a lot of people have a misconception about this. And that's true. Like, let's say, let's say you're single and you make, um, I don't know, 5000 Five hundred thousand. Let's see. Yeah, five hundred eighteen thousand. You said fifty to two hundred. Yeah, but now I'm five hundred thousand. Now you're thirty five. Now you're over thirty. You're thirty seven percent bracket at five hundred thirteen. Five hundred eighteen thousand. Where's her glasses? I, I this print is way too small, man. This is this is for a forty year old, not a sixty year old. Anyway, I'm just gonna say five hundred thousand. You, you, you go with that. I'll round it. Yes. <laughs> So that means some of your income is taxed at 10%, some at 12, some at 22, some at 24, some at 32, some at 35, and 5,001. Just I'm using that as a round number. Sure. Okay, that $1 is taxed at 37%, but not the whole thing. So that's why we always talk about line 10. We used to always say line 43, but since they changed the tax returns, line 10 is taxable income. It's actually different for 2019. They already changed it. Yeah. It's line what? I don't know, but it's not 10. <laughs> because they got such a backlash of how bad that tax well, return was? Y- you know why? Because they took a, a perfectly good tax return that was on two pages, and they made it eight pages to try to simplify it. Yeah. And because they had two pages that fit on a postcard, and then they had but they had all the, pages all the that... same laws. So they had to have six supporting schedules to, to for all the lines that were omitted. 
So then people didn't like that. So now they said, okay, we're going to make the postcard a little bit bigger. And they eliminated um, three pages. So now it's a, still the postcard, which is bigger than a postcard that no one is ever going to put in because your social security number's on there. But that's a whole other point. Anyway, there's three schedules <coughs> instead God. of six. Look at taxable income. <laughs> And then from there, then like because we talk about Roth IRA conversions quite a bit, and it's like, well, how much should I convert? Should I convert all of it? Should I just convert this? How much, right? So we look at what tax bracket are you in? What tax bracket do you you think you're going to be? And then convert to the top of that bracket. So if Steve is single, and let's say he wants to convert to the top of the 22% tax bracket, Right, I'm guessing that's going to be roughly about eighty thousand dollars. Yep, eighty-five thousand. So if he's making fifty, you got thirty-five thousand dollars to stay in that twenty-two percent tax bracket. If you get all of a sudden a, a raise or you get a bonus of five thousand, you still convert thirty-five, but then all of a sudden five thousand jumps into the twenty-four. Well, not everything is going to be taxed at the twenty-four. Just the five thousand dollars additional would be taxed at that bracket. Yeah, and we do get that question all the time. Oh, what if I go a dollar over? We don't want to do that. And I have to say, well, that dollar gets taxed another couple pennies. Right. But, but that's it. That's it. So great question, Steve. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps. So look at taxable income, and then, yeah, then you can really start mapping out and planning your tax strategy. Um, so we, we do talk about that kind of often. And I'm surprised you were probably listening to some other. We haven't talked about that in a while, though. Yeah, it's been about an hour. <laughs> I was probably listening to some other show and missed it. So we actually got a voice recording. What? Um, who do we got? Hello, my name's Cole, and I was just calling to uh, ask a question for the podcast. So I haven't really listened for too long. I mostly just started like about a week ago, but I've listened to about ten or so so far, just on my way to work and my black Hyundai Elantra. Um, <laughs> so right now I have a lot of money that I've been investing into a Roth IRA and into my TSP, also in Roth, as I'm in the Air Force. But I was wondering, I want to start investing even more than the maximum contributions for both Roth, TSP, and my Roth IRA, which I'm currently maxing out both. And I want to start contributing to um, my own brokerage account through Vanguard. So I was wondering how that works with capital gains tax with your regular tax. So for example, uh, if I make $50,000 a year now, and I make, let's say, $20,000 worth of capital gains tax, I know that it's a separate tax rate, but does it affect the $50,000 that I currently make on the bottom or on the top? And what I mean by that is like, if I make $50,000 a year, and let's say that that was theoretically taxed at 20%, versus if I was bumped up to 70,000, then taxed at 25% because of that, does that come from the bottom or the top? That made no sense. But hopefully you get the idea of what I'm saying because I didn't really, and I just kind of called off the cuff. So <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it, and I love watching the podcast while well, listening to it, and have a wonderful day. Awesome. I, I, I know exactly what Cole is talking about. I, I do, too. Let's explain it. Because, all right. Well, first of all, Cole, thank you for your service um, in the uh, Thank you for letting us know what kind of car you drive because that just made us feel like we were now driving. We, well, we don't know where he is. Yeah, where the hell are you, Cole? Where are you driving your, your well, he's, Honda? Al he's in the Elantra. Air Force. He, he's in the air. Yeah, all the he, time. yeah, he's I flying. Mean, yeah, he's Maverick. Anyway, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I know what he's asking to you, but go ahead. So when he's asking, is it on the top or the bottom? Because a capital gain has a different tax rate. It could be zero, could be fifteen percent, or could be twenty, depending on what your adjusted gross income is. Okay, or what your taxable income is. Yep. Um, what he's saying is that all right, I make fifty thousand dollars a year of ordinary income, and if I have twenty thousand dollars of capital gains, does the capital gains start at the bottom and then all of a sudden push my fifty thousand dollars up into the higher tax brackets, or does the fifty thousand dollars stay and let's say uh, he's taxed at a little bit at ten and a little bit at twelve? Sure. Right? And then do the capital gains sit on top of the 50, and then from there, those are taxed at capital gains rates. So he can use the bottom brackets, the 10 and the 12, or the 22% bracket with ordinary income, and then would the additional capital gains sit on top of that so it doesn't push his other income into those higher brackets? 
Yeah, that's exactly the question. Now and I actually understand it. See? I did and, not know what he meant. And, yes. and is the, it up or bottom? Is it in? And, is and it Cole, out? you're going to like the answer because the capital gains always sit on top of ordinary income. So it does not push the ordinary income up into a t- higher bracket. So let's just use your numbers of $50,000. let us say you're single. We don't know that for sure, but let's just say you're single. So if you make $50,000 a year and with a standard dedu- deduction of about what, $12,000, that puts you about 38000 taxable income, which is about the top of the 12% bracket. So that means your salary is going to be, you're going to pay 10 and 12% regardless of how many capital gains that you have. Now, your capital gains sit on top, and because your capital gains would effectively push you into the next bracket, Right, which is the 22% bracket, those are taxed at 15%. So your ordinary income is taxed at the lower brackets. The capital gains, because you're above that 12% bracket, is taxed at the capital gains rate of 15%. And then plus the state, which you didn't give us. Yeah, well, he's in the air, so it, it's, it changes. <laughs> it is a long <laughs> it, it changes. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you, because if coal stays in the 10 or 12 percent tax bracket yeah then the capital gains is actually tax free yeah so let's yeah let's let's just let's say, say he's married now okay okay perfect so so now let's just say married and that's all the income they make and they get it they double up on the standard deduction so i'm just going to say it's thirty thousand dollars taxable income just to be simple and the the top of the 12 percent bracket is about eighty thousand which means now, Cole, if you could have fifty thousand dollars of capital gains to get to that eighty thousand, and now since you're in even combined on a twelve percent bracket, the capital gains are tax free, if as long as they're long term. And a lot of people don't realize this: when you're in the lowest two tax brackets, ten and twelve percent, capital gain rate is zero, at least for federal, not for state, but at least for federal. And some people ask me, Joe, like, well, my my tax plan comes seventy nine thousand. So what if I have a hundred thousand dollar capital gain? Is that all tax free? No, only a thousand of it to get you to the eighty thousand. Everything else then is at fifteen percent. So on the other side, though, too, because your tax bracket is so much higher because you had that hundred thousand dollar capital gain, even though your taxable income of ordinary income is still in the twelve percent tax bracket. That's right. People get a little bit confused there as well. It's like, oh, well. Now, do I still get at least the thousand dollars tax free? Yeah. Just because my taxable income is so much higher because of all of the capital gain that I received, but you would still get the thousand dollars tax free. Yeah, you would. And, and so, for tax geeks out there, let me give you the formula. So, figure out your ordinary income and your ordinary deductions, like your standard de- deduction. That's your ordinary tax. Look at the tax table. Figure the tax. Then you add your capital gains on top of that at capital gain rates to figure out what that is. How about this? So there's um, the net investment income tax comes in right at two hundred thousand single two hundred fifty if I'm married. Yeah, and that's adjusted gross income. Just a, a GI. And so let's say that I have two hundred fifty one thousand dollars of adjusted gross income. Okay. Okay. Hundred thousand dollars of that was capital gains. Okay. So. Does one thousand dollars get the additional net investment income tax, or does the entire hundred thousand dollars get the um, um, the the three point eight percent? Yeah, just one thousand if you're married, right? Because it's two hundred fifty thousand, everything above two fifty. So it's the lower of the excess amount or the passive income. In this case, the capital gains, the passive income. Right now, if you were if if you're single, and the floor is two hundred thousand, and you were at uh, what would you say like two. Two fifty six. So then, fifty six thousand is subject to the three point eight percent tax, but not the whole hundred. So, with every, just about every tax situation, you know, let's say if I had a taxable income of a hundred thousand dollars, and I would be, if I was married, let's say I would be in the twenty two percent tax bracket. Yeah. So some people think, well, then uh, all of my income is taxed at twenty two percent. Yeah. So I pay twenty two thousand to the feds. Right. So it's but it's stair steps, right? It's, a yeah. little bit is taxed at ten, this and that. And once I'm in that bracket, that's all I'm paying tax on. The same thing is true for capital gains. The same thing is true for net investment income tax. So once you break those th- thresholds then the, only the additional above those thresholds would be taxed at those different rates. Right. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And the IRS generally tries to do that so you're not penalized for going a dollar over and have all this giant extra tax. Right. So There are exceptions, though. Yes. What? One is the, um, the ACA Medicare. credit. Yeah. And Medicare. Yeah, and Premiums. Medicare and, and Social Security taxability. So there are, there are some exceptions there. So. Anything else? Medicare, Social Security. 
Well, like if, if you if you have well, the subs- lot, the lot, subsidies, yeah, subsidies. If, if you lose money on rental properties, you start as you add income. Also, you lose losses at the same time. So yeah, there's there there are some problems. The um, um, the the twenty percent um, I'm forgetting the name of it. The twenty percent small business deduction. QBI. Yeah, thank you, QBI. The, yeah, there's some cliffs there. Check the podcast show notes for more on QBI, the Qualified Business Income Deduction. John in South Carolina, Andy in Cincinnati, PV, Greg in Florida, and our good friend Marcus, we've got your questions on deck to be answered next week. I hope all of you are staying safe and healthy wherever you are in the world. Check out yourmoneyyourwealth.com to learn what we're doing here at Pure Financial Advisors to keep our employees and clients safe and healthy. And subscribe to the Pure Financial Advisors YouTube channel to watch weekly webinars with Joe and Pure Here's Director of Research, Brian Perry, CFP, CFA, providing updates and commentary on the latest in the financial markets. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the podcast show notes to read the full transcript of today's episode, access those updates and webinars, and subscribe. While you're there, click the Ask Joe and Al on air banner to send in your questions, and the fellows will answer just as soon as they're able. Shea writes in from New York. Hey, guys. Just recently found your show, and I'm a big fan. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> Enjoy the insight. Coupled with the random detours and humor along the way. Do we do random detours? Never. <laughs> Got the wrong show, Shay. <laughs> do we ever laugh? <laughs> yeah, I think so giggle. much people complain about it. Yeah, because you giggle like a little child. Apparently. You're Dr. Roth. <laughs> That's right. I need some respect. Come on. <laughs> Was looking for some advice on retirement accounts. I'm 30 years old and live in New York. I make $225,000 a year. Currently, I fully fund a Roth 401k and Roth IRA, and my employer matches 5%. I also have money saved in a brokerage account and a um, high-yielding savings account outside of retirement. I've been debating converting my employer's match from traditional to Roth and paying the taxes, uh, but I'm also, uh, but I am not sure I should. I kind of like the idea of hedging my tax situation down the road. Curious on your guys' thoughts, given my age tax bracket. Current traditional balance is forty-five thousand. Thanks, and look forward to hearing uh, what you guys think. Uh, all right, Shay, thirty years old, making two hundred twenty-five thousand bucks a year. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's that's about ten times better than I did at age thirty. I would say it's probably a lot more than that. <laughs> and Shay, I'm just curious: are you single or married? Just for that's, tax purposes. That's ah, okay. I was starting to wonder, Joe. <laughs> Currently, I fully fund the Roth 401k. Um, the poor match is five percent. So, but Shay's. Fully funding a Roth IRA. Yeah, Roth and a 401k. I don't think you can fund a Roth IRA, Shay. You make $225,000. Uh, I would agree with you. So just Unless, unless it's a backdoor Roth. Yeah. Just be, be careful with the, that, that contribution because your income might be too high for you to do a direct Roth IRA contribution. Um, unless it's, like Al said, uh, if you put it into an IRA and then automatically convert it. So the employer's match in 5%. So the question she has is, should she convert the match? My, my answer is, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Yeah, because you, you actually want tax diversification. And, and so it's, it's okay to have some regular uh, 401k money and have Roth 401k money. And then in retirement, you can pick from either. Right, because there's... I, I guess historically, there's always going to be rates that are you know lower, ten percent, twelve percent. There's standard deductions, so you do want to take tax deductions, especially if you're in that that high of a bracket. If you're single, two hundred twenty five thousand dollars. That's a pretty high bracket. So you know, I get the fact that you want to go Roth IRA and you're getting the match, and you're like, you know what? Let me just convert the match to and have everything Roth, and I'm hedging my tax. Uh, liability, so everything's going to be tax-free when I retire. I love that, but you don't necessarily be sh- so glued on that because it's a 5% match. So now, let's say in retirement, you have a few hundred thousand dollars that is going to come out taxable. Yes. I mean, who cares? You can you, you slowly leak that out and you, you use up the the lower brackets. Yeah, you can probably. The bulk of the money is going to be in Roth anyway. 
I mean, if you, if you talk about when to convert it, assuming that all these tax laws hold for the next 50 years, right, you, you would convert it when, you're, when your tax bracket's lower. Like, let's say between jobs or maybe upon retirement, that's, that would be the better time. But, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think you're doing the right thing by um, getting as much money to the Roth as possible and uh, go for some tax diversification. It's all right. Yeah. So, okay, very cool. Uh, thanks, Shay. Hopefully that helps you out. All right. David Chicago writes in, in Podcast 257, you responded to Kenny from Granite City regarding Illinois state taxes and whether or not to use a regular 401k or Roth 401k due to the lack of state tax on withdrawals. For states that provide a deduction for regular 401k but not a tax on withdrawals or conversions, I would contend no one should ever irrespective of their tax bracket, make a Roth 401k contribution. If you desire to do so, you should first make a regular 401k contribution to obtain the deduction and then convert. This locks in a 5% effective gain with the same result of having the funds in a Roth. For my question, when does it make sense to engage in such a strategy, even when you are in the top tax bracket? I already have significant balances my 401k, a million dollars plus, and these amounts should continue to build due to the company profit sharing and contributions. I plan to work 15 more years. Thank you. Truly enjoy the show. Um, very good point, David. So David's saying, hey, if there's no tax on IRA or retirement withdrawals from the state of Illinois, why on earth would you do a Roth 401k makes no yeah, sense because you because you could otherwise get the deduction up front and then you convert and you don't pay the five percent tax for the state of Illinois. Uh, very well said there, David. So, a um, couple of things is that you've got to be careful with that strategy too, depending because I like tax compounding tax free growth is something that is kind of forgotten here in the in the equation. If I convert, let's say, $30,000 and still pay the 5%, and now that 30000 is in a Roth and compounding for me over the next 15 years, right? that 30000 is going to be something a lot larger in 15 years, 100% tax-free. You're stating, don't do it, put everything into the regular 401k and then convert at a later date and save that 5%. But for me to get the same amount of money into a Roth IRA 15 years from now, that conversion is going to be a lot larger, and the amount of taxes that I'm potentially going to pay to match that is going to be that much larger. Does that make sense? I think so. I, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this question. Because he's not paying 5% tax on the w uh, withdrawals uh, on the, of retirement accounts. Okay, so but how about a situation where... You go ahead and set up the Roth 401k now because you're anticipating moving to another state in retirement, right? So there wouldn't any, be any benefit then. Well, just... it, no. All right. So what he's saying is that if I take the deduction, because if a Roth 401k is is after tax, so you right. pay 5% state tax, let's call it 22% federal tax, all Right. you pay that, money goes into the Roth. Yeah. Make sense? Gotcha. Or let's say it's $10,000. Okay. I'm going to put $10,000 into my Roth 401k plan. I'm going to pay 10000 federal tax, 5000 state tax, just to make the math really simple. Got it. Got it. All right. So that would be $1,500 in tax to get the $10,000 into the Roth. Make sense? Yeah. Yep. He's saying don't do that. Do $10,000 pre tax. Save that money and then convert the ten thousand dollars into a Roth because the ten thousand dollar conversion you're not going to pay the five percent state tax on it, so it's only going to cost me a thousand dollars in tax to convert the ten thousand dollars because I got the deduction. So that that assumes you can do it as you go, right? Exactly. That so, was my point. Yeah. So it means you have to either have an in-service withdrawal ability or you have to have a Roth option that allows you to do conversions in plan. Right. And if that's the case, then yes, I, I agree with David wholeheartedly. So you're making the contribution one year, and then you're just automatically converting it each year, each year. You're just converting out. Yeah. Otherwise, you 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 keep it in this account, and all the growth is is taxable. You got it. Yeah. So at least on a federal level. On the federal level, and I don't really care for that. So I might forego that, even though I I don't pay tax on 
the state of whatever state that allows tax-free distributions from retirement accounts, if I can't do that in-service conversion, I think I would still take advantage of the Roth regardless, or he said a very kind of a big word, irrespective of your tax. Irrespective. 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 I knew I screwed that up. (laughs) Um, uh, And So what what he's looking at, um, he's planning to work 15 years. When should he start doing conversions? Well, you got to take a look at your tax bracket. You already got a uh, one and a half or a million dollars plus in a retirement account. That's going to, let's say, 15 years, if you're going to still put in a full 401k contribution plus a big profit sharing, I don't know, that could be three million bucks. Now you got three million bucks, 100% of it's going to be taxed at the federal level, which is a lot higher tax rate than the state level. So then you're like, okay, should I now do I convert? I mean, yeah, but you're not going to nearly get enough money into the Roth to have a true diversified strategy. I could run the numbers for you until I'm blue in the face and, and, and show you that doing the Roth is going to be better for you now, given the fact that David has this much money. Right. And then I'll go back to my first point. If David moves to another state and he pulls the money out or converts it, oh, I see he, what you're he saying. still pays state tax anyway. Right. So, but. Who would want to leave Chi Town? Well, that's a good point. Chicago. Just thinking he might want to come to California. So, but you, you, I guess, David, let's just take that five percent out right now. Look at what tax bracket that you're in, and then I would run a projection to say fifteen years, putting X amount of dollars in the four hundred one k plan. I have no idea what the profit sharing component is. I don't know how much that you are putting in. I don't know if you're married or single or how much money that your spouse has and everything else, but. Right now, with 15 years still to go to retirement, and you have a million dollar plus in a tax deferred account, that's only going to create more tax problems in the future. And I bet you, let's say if you're in the 22% tax bracket federally, that's going to go to the 25% tax bracket or 28% tax bracket. So you're doing all this stuff to save 5%, where you could be losing 20% in the future, right? So you can't just look at everything in a bubble, irrespective of your tax bracket. Yeah. How'd that sound? That was clever. Sounded like you knew what you were talking about. Yeah. Alan just writes me a script. (laughs) (laughs) And then I can tune out. I just just read read it. it. Yeah. If you missed the episode Dave was talking about regarding states that don't tax withdrawals, you'll find it in the show notes along with our Roth IRA basics guide. And on the subject of taxes, I want to quickly mention that since we recorded the answers to all of these questions, the IRS has extended the tax filing and tax payment deadline for your 2019 taxes from April 15th to July 15th for all taxpayers. You'll find the IRS's written guidance on these extensions in the podcast show notes. The California Franchise Tax Board has also delayed until July 15th, but you'll want to check with your local tax authorities in other states to find out when your state tax filing deadline is. So when you hear Big Al say April 15th in a little bit, remember that it's actually July 15th this year. Now, Tennessee Dave has a question about the purpose of Roth conversions. Um, You call him Tennessee Dave or does he go by? That's what he called himself. Was that somewhere later in the email or is that how he started? He signed it. Thanks, Tennessee Dave. Oh. So I just moved the Tennessee Dave to the top. Got it. Tennessee Dave. Hi, Andy, Joe, and Big Al. Love your show. Been listening for about a year now and have a question about Roth IRA conversions. First time question on conversions, Big Al. Yeah, right? My wife and I are both 61. I retired from full-time work this year and will still work part-time for the next two to three years. My wife retired this year and is no longer working. I've been self-employed for the last 25 years while my wife has been a W-2 employee. Our three children are grown, married, out of the house and on their own. We have been blessed with being able to earn a very good income and have been careful with our spending, so we've amassed decent savings. Ready to go, Tennessee Dave. Currently, our investments are split between regular taxable investment accounts, my SEP IRA, regular IRAs, and my wife's 403B. The total in the IRAs is just shy of $2 million. bucks. We have not done any Roth conversions yet because our income in the past has been in the 35% or higher tax bracket. But now that our income is lower, I'm considering it. We'll be in the 24% tax bracket this year. I can convert fifty dollars or $60,000 for the next 10 years and still stay in that 24% tax bracket. 
and pay the tax due from our regular savings and have enough income left to meet our lifestyle needs. In our situation, we will not spend all that we have by the time we die. Okay. Tennessee Dave's had a little thought. Yeah. Great situation. Yeah, I'm just kind of painting the picture, just thinking about Tennessee Dave and his <laughs> lovely wife and his children and it's how a, blessed he was to make a bunch of money. Right. It's a great life. Uh, most of the simulations we have run would leave somewhere between one and one and a half million left, even if we live into our early 90s, most of which we would leave to our children. If we did Roth conversions, I'm assuming the money we leave them would mainly be uh, the unspent Roth IRA funds. All right, so he's thinking he's going to give the kids the Roths. Which they could let ride for 10 years and take a lump sum distribution and no, no taxes. That is good for them. But what did doing the conversions get me? <laughs> now Tennessee Dave is a little selfish. <laughs> well, there's got to be something in it for Dave. I love my children. Kind of. <laughs> he didn't say that. <laughs> well, it sure sounds like it. <laughs> but from my viewpoint... It seems to me that I'm all I'm accomplishing by doing a Roth conversion is paying taxes on money that I'm likely never going to need and will end up leaving to my children. If I left it all that money in the regular IRAs and did no conversions, we would just take took out the RMDs over the years between 72 and let's say age 90, assuming a conservative 5 or 6% growth rate over the years. How much would we be left in the regular IRA for them to inherit? And how much would they be left with after uh, the 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 or, or with the account that he used to pay the taxes? How would this compare to inheriting a Roth if I did those conversions? So he's looking if I convert or not to convert. What the hell's the difference for the kids? It seems like he's getting screwed. The kids are going to make out like bandits, and right. he's like, "Well, this sucks." How would right? Is is that what you heard? Yeah, that's what I heard. So, something like that. Yep. If the benefit is significant, I'm willing to bite the bullet and do the conversions to pay the taxes owed. However, if the benefit is not that much, which is what I contend, although I love my kids very much, I would just as soon not go through the trouble and just let them pay the taxes on the IRA money that they inherit. What am I missing? Whew, Tennessee Dave. <laughs> well, here's, here's what you're missing, Tennessee Dave, is that the reason, one of the main reasons that you do the Roth conversions when your income is lower, before Social Security, before required minimum distributions, is that at that point you can actually pull those those dollars out to do the, uh, the do the Roth conversions while in lower brackets, and that avoids you paying higher taxes when you hit seventy two and your RMDs kick in on two million dollars of. IRAs, which could be three or four million dollars, if you're 61 now, at the time where you start withdrawing, the RMDs start, right? So if I did my math right, your required minimum distribution could be 160,000. I don't know what other kind of income you have. Then there's Social Security on top of that. Then we're going back to the old tax rates. You'll probably be in the 25 to 28 percent bracket. If you can do some conversions now while you're working part time, and then maybe that's for two or three years, then you're in a lower bracket. You can get a bunch of money out while, for sure, in in lower tax brackets. It'll it'll save you from paying higher taxes later on. Tennessee Dave, here's the information that we would need, or that here's a calculation that you have to take a look at. So your wife has a 403B. She's not working. I'm assuming she has a pension. So you have to, right? I, I bet they have very high fixed income because if they're in the 35% tax bracket, now they're still in the 24% tax bracket. Well, the 24% tax bracket was the 28% tax bracket that goes to like 300 and some on thousand dollars as a married couple. Right. So if you're working part time, all right, so now you've got to start taking a look at some different type of tax planning here. If you're in the 24% tax bracket as a married couple and your wife is no longer working and you're working part-time, part-time. and you're still in that higher bracket, double check to make sure that you're in the 24% tax bracket, Tennessee Dave. Um, if you are, then where's the income sources coming from? Do you have a pension and how big of part-time income do you have from your self-employment? Because you might be able to shelter some of that and do even larger conversions. So, I mean, there's all sorts of different tools that you could use depending on what the overall overall situation looks like. But saying you got $2 million in retirement accounts, you're probably not going to spend it all. And then you're looking, hey, I'm still going to have a couple of million dollars left over. I'm just going to draw some money of this out, have a conservative growth rate on it, 
and then the kids are going to get the money. If I do all these conversions and pay all this tax, it seems net net I lose and the kids win. I think you're, the, the the math is off because you have to look at your taxable income on your tax return, which is line 10, and then compare that to what brackets are from the IRS code to see how much room do you truly have? Because he says 10 years. Well, the, the tax code is going to change at five. Right. And and so the key is, and you said if you live into your early 90s, your required minimum distributions start at 72. So you're going to have roughly 20 years with much higher income still over and above what you have right now. So consider that tax rate. Right. And the, the RMDs continue to go up. They want you to deplete that account before you die. So it's not that RMD stays steady at 4%. It, it continues to increase. The older you get, more and more money has to come out of the retirement account. And then that's going to potentially push you up into higher tax brackets, losing that money less to kids. But you don't care about your kids anyway. I'm kidding. I know you love your kids very much. But you can leverage it even better. You can pay less tax for you, and you could spend more money today, and you can give more to your kids if you do the right planning. All right, we got Chris from Austin, Texas. Greetings to you, Joe, Al, and Andy. Even though I'm very tech and social savvy, he's a latecomer to the world of finance, though. That was out here, so at 63, I'm not sure what he's writing. I'm a latecomer to the world of financial info that was out here, so at 63. That was out here? Yeah. Out here in Austin, Texas? No, out in the world, like podcasts. Oh, out here in the world of So he's listening to a we're, podcast we're as a he's podcast. typing this. Yeah, all right. All right, uh, at 63. I began um, my bringing back in December. Binging. Oh, binging. Binging. I, I thought it's a bring. I got to get glasses. I got to get a new license. Here, and, let me pull out my glasses for you. Um, God, I'm 40 years old. My eyes are gone. Plus, plus, plus. Yeah, plus, right. plus. <laughs> Wow. All right. I began my binging uh, back in December and quickly got fixated on your podcast. Your podcasts have top billing now. Uh, thanks for what you offer and the focus you put on Roth IRAs. Even though I binge to catch up with what you've covered, I can't find from you or anyone about the ways you can stumble into a Roth conversion. What I mean is, I did a Roth conversion last year by converting $100,000 from a rollover traditional IRA I had into a Roth. All of my reading and prepping had told me that all I had to do was be prepared to pay the taxes on that money for my tax bracket. Then I started running into podcasts and reading, talking about putting money into a non-qualified IRA for the purpose of converting to a Roth IRA and the taxes involved in doing so. I'm not sure what, what I did now and if it's going to cause me additional costs at tax time. Can you explain the different paths to converting to Roth IRAs and if what I did is going to cost me some penalty? Thanks. And I hope one day I actually get on your schedule and catch a live show. Hopefully, if you answered this one, hopefully, if you answered this one, by the way, infested with taxes stuck with me in the term you should coin. That's a good term. Yeah, infested. That's what an IRA is. It's infested. infested with taxes. It's infested with taxes. You could say infected, too. Um, if so, uh, fits. It so fits what I've learned during my FI indoctrination. Oh, God. Thank you, Andy. Thank you so much, guys. Happy trails. <laughs> so Chris is very socially savvy. Yeah. And he's doing some Roths. And how many ways can he do a Roth conversion? Is that what he's asking? I'm a little confused. <laughs> Let's go back. What I mean is, I did a Roth conversion last year by converting. Do you think he like he he talked it versus typed it? it so like he, he used so one of those um, like dictating. Maybe. So I, he did a hundred thousand uh, dollar conversion from a traditional IRA. All of my reading and prepping had told me all, that all I had to do was be prepared to pay taxes on the money for my tax bracket. Okay, so far so good. All right. So then, there's then I, there, there's also confusion here with sometimes. People will convert, let's say, $100,000. They're in the 12% tax bracket, and they think they only have to pay 12% tax on the $100,000. But that $100,000 conversion put them in the 22% tax bracket. 
So now they have to pay 22% tax on the $100,000 when they said, well, I'm in the 12% tax bracket. Why do I have to pay 22% on this $100,000 conversion? What the hell happened? Yeah, it's not fair. It's because the brackets stair step. So you have you pay a little bit of tax at 12%, a little bit of tax at 22 and so on. So depending on how much income that that conversion is going to do, you're going to pay taxes in different brackets depending on the amount of the conversion. So that could be a source of some problems. It, it could be. And, and just to clarify, as you go into the next bracket, it's only those few extra dollars in the next bracket that get taxed at the higher amount. It's not the entire income. So let's be aware of that. But if, if we sort of go on, he, he's I guess he heard about putting money into a non-qualified IRA. What do you think that is? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, maybe a non-deductible IRA. That, that's the best I can do, too. He, he probably heard about a backdoor Roth and putting money in and not getting a deduction, and then doing a Roth conversion, not paying tax on that, which you can do, but not if you have other IRA money because of the aggregation rule and the pro rata rules, rule. Right. So that doesn't necessarily work. I, th I think, Chris, you didn't do anything wrong. There's You do a Roth conversion, you'll pay tax, right? That, that's what you're, you're expecting. That's what's going to happen. You'll pay tax on April 15th. I will say, in certain cases, you may have been required to make estimated payments after your Roth conversion, and if you don't make those estimated penalties, you could be potentially penalized on April 15th. It's usually not a huge penalty, but just, just be aware of that. For some people that don't want to pay an extra dollar to the, the IRS, which is a lot of people, just be aware that uh, in some cases you may have to pay the tax before April 15th. So, yeah, th there's basically three ways to do a Roth conversion. One way is an IRA directly into a Roth IRA, and you pay the tax on the amount of money that you converted, depending on what bracket you're in. Okay, right. Second is that you can do a 401k into a Roth 401k or IRA. So there's inner plan conversions. I have a Roth component in my 401k plan. I could put money from a pre-tax into the Roth component of the 401k. That's a conversion, but it stays in the 401k plan. Or I could directly convert from a 401k to a Roth IRA. The other is that I make a non-deductible IRA contribution and then convert that. In most cases, if you do it correctly, you don't have to pay tax on the conversion. And the reason why people don't pay tax on that conversion because it's an after-tax contribution and they have no other IRAs in their name. And I don't think of any other conversion you could do. Well, you could do, um, if you can get after, after tax, tax money in a 401k, in a 401k right. and then you, then you can convert that and pay no tax. Yeah, that's the... Mega backdoor. Yeah, mega backdoor is what people like to call it. <laughs> the, we have other names. The, the, right? the garage. The garage. <laughs> you garage. have other names. Yes. That, yeah, you have other. You, you have other thoughts when you say it, <laughs> which we won't repeat here. Okay, Margaret writes in from Richmond, Virginia. Hi, Joe, Big Allen, Andy. Love, love, really love the show. My wife recently retired from her job, and I still work and contribute the max to my Roth IRA. Can my wife contribute the max to her existing Roth IRA, or does she have to contribute to a separate spousal Roth IRA? Thanks, guys. Keep up the good work. Good question. So let's talk about a spousal IRA. So if you're married. One spouse is not working, but one spouse is working. Both spouses can still contribute to a retirement account. Yeah, as long as there's enough earned income for the one that is working. Correct. So $7,000 is the max for a Roth IRA contribution. 50 and older. So one spouse needs to at least be making $14,000 a year for both spouses to make that fourteen or 7000 each contribution. Right. All right. The answer to your question is no. It doesn't have to be. A, I mean, it's a, it, logically, it's good thinking. It's like, all right, well, here, one spouse is retired. Do they have to open up like a separate account? Does it have to say spousal, spousal Roth. IRA yeah. or spousal Roth IRA? Because it wasn't from her income. Correct. Yeah. So um, the answer is no. You could continue to contribute into the same retirement account. It's just a term that they use. Yeah. And by the way, and we get this question, we have got this question, is it needs to go into her account, not yours, right? Sometimes people get confused about that. It's based upon your income but it goes into her account. Correct. So 
one spouse makes the income, both spouses can make the IRA contributions. Right, into the, and into their own individual retirement accounts. There's no such thing as a joint account. Yep. Or a spousal IRA account, right? It's not going to say spousal IRA. It's just their own IRA or Roth IRA. Um, do we got t- time for one more or no? Now wrap it up. Jeez. Yeah. Like Krabby Pants. Is <laughs> <laughs> you asked a question, I answered. Come on now. Whether you call it the garage door, the big-ass barn door, or the mega back door, this type of Roth conversion might be right for your situation. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the show notes and check out Joe and Big Al's previous discussions of the mega backdoor Roth strategy. Now, I may have been crabby pants and said that we're out of time, and generally we do like to finish up our episodes in about 45 minutes, but Sunil has been waiting for the answer to his question for a long time, so we're going to squeak that in now. Thanks to all of you for your patience as we make our way through the email inbox. Click Ask Joe and Al on the air in the podcast show notes and send in yours. Uh, Sunil, he wrote in, Alan, uh, doesn't give a location. So this must be a first-time listener. Could be. Could be. We'd like to know where you're at, Sunil. And we'd like to know what color your car, what type of car you <laughs> and have. what kind of dog you're walking. Yeah, no, we don't need, well, well, yeah, it's fun what? to kind of chat about it. <laughs> right. All right. Um, so he writes in, hello, YMYW team. So Sunil, if you're going YMYW, you know you're a listener. So w- where are you calling from? Uh, oh, and he just writes in, a long-time listener of your podcast. Really enjoy the content and the hilarious answers that make me Rolf. <laughs> Roll on the floor laughing. Oh, is that what that is? Oh. Rolful. Roll, Rolful. Rolful. I would have had no idea what that meant. All right. Um, have a unique situation. Uh, I am an Indian citizen on a work visa in the USA and unsure and when I would get permanent residency or citizen- citizenship. Um, hopefully, I can stick around for another five to ten years. I have two sons, age seven and five, both U.S. citizens by birth. I want to start a 529 college savings plan for both, just in case I'm lucky enough to stick around um, for long and they go to college here. But I, if I have to go back and if kids decide to do their college in India, I might withdraw the 529 plan money. At that point, um, Indian colleges are not 529 uh, qualified international colleges. Now, did you know that, Al? I had a good suspicion. Okay. I know I will have to pay a 10% penalty on the growth, but at that point, since I won't have U.S. income, will I have to pay income taxes on it? Huh. Interesting. Very interesting. Yep. So he is now in India, Alan. He, he's, 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 he blows out of the 529 plan. Yeah, he's, he's saying if he, if he has to go back to India and he blows out of the 529 plan, now what? Yeah, he doesn't have any U.S. income. Right. So he's like, well, if I don't have any U.S. income, I don't have to pay any tax. I'll pay the 10% penalty, but I'm not going to pay any tax because I don't have U.S. income. Well, it depends. It, it depends, right, how much income he's got out of this because he has to pay tax on the income as well as penalty. So he's got to he's do both. So let's say he puts in $40,000 and it grows to... Sixty thousand dollars, let's just say, and when he when he pulls it out, he'll have to pay tax on twenty grand growth, plus he'll have to pay ten percent penalty on that twenty grand. Okay, so he has zero income in USA, except for that, right? So he's got yeah twenty thousand yeah. dollars of income. Yeah, and and if he's single, and the standard deduction is 13, twelve five thirteen thousand, let's just say he'd have seven thousand of income in the ten percent bracket. He could owe seven hundred dollars income tax, uh, as well as ten percent penalty on. Twenty grand in my example, right? So then he'd have another two thousand dollars. So he'd have twenty seven hundred dollars in that example. On the other hand, if he takes a little bit out this year and a little bit out next year, to where he stays to negative taxable income, there is no tax, but he does have to pay the penalty. So how about if he makes a million dollars in India, okay. and he's got this five twenty nine plan with twenty thousand dollars of growth? Okay. So how does that all work? He's not a U.S. citizen, so he just has to file a U.S. tax return for the $20,000 of growth and take the standard deduction and do it that way, yes. even though he's making money in India? Yes, because he's got U.S. source income. So I don't know much about tax law in India. So I'll, You're I'll, not an expert? I'll admit that. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know if it were the other way. Let's just say— Well, how about if let, he works for a U.S. company in India? 
Okay. Well, it depends. He's if, not a U.S. citizen. He's, he, yeah. So he's not a U.S. citizen. So it wouldn't it wouldn't, wouldn't matter, matter right? Matter. So so but the, the basic rule, if it's the other way, like, like let's just say he's in the U.S. and he has all this uh, income from India. Uh, then he would have to pick that up on his tax return in the U.S. because U.S. taxes on worldwide income, and then he gets a tax credit for taxes he paid in India. That's the basic premise of, of, so, U, of U.S. taxes, U.S. taxes and foreign income, and that's true whether you're a U.S. citizen or you're just a resident in the U.S. So U.S. taxes on worldwide income, but India probably does not tax on worldwide well, income. That I don't know. That's what I'm saying. That's I'm not why you're saying a, you're I'm not, not an, expert. an expert on that. So he might have to file that income on his India's tax return? He might. Yeah. As a dual citizen of the United States and Australia, I know that every country has different rules regarding they, whether or not they will tax their income, your income, depending they do. on and, where and, you are. And as a matter of fact, if hmm. you were ever curious about this, there every single country has tax treaties with every other country. Yep. So that's why you won't find too many accountants that can just spit out the rules. You have to go actually to a, a you, specialist. You're in not that. just an average accountant now. No, but I'm... He's Big Al. I'm... I'm uh, I'm average plus, but I'm not an international expert. <laughs> Got it. Um, hopefully that helps, Sunil. Um, so, yeah. I but, think- but I think that does bring up a good point, and we've mentioned this before, but I'll, I'll repeat it again. And that is if you take money out of, of a 529 plan that wasn't used for education, for qualifying education, then you do have to pay taxes and penalties, but only on the growth, not on the entire amount. Yeah, I guess for those of you that don't know what a 529 plan is, it's a college savings plan that you can invest in that will grow 100% tax-free if used for qualified educational expenses. Right. So the yep. SECURE Act kind of opened up a little bit more opportunity there, but not as much as I think people hope. Yeah, great. We do have a couple of derails at the very end of this episode, so stick around if you like the non-financial nonsense. And as always, thank you for listening. We do appreciate our YMYW community. You guys really do make this show what it is with your great emails and voice messages and your fun. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the free assessment button at yourmoneyyourwealth.com and you can sign up for a no-cost, no-obligation, two-meeting assessment via video web meeting with a certified financial planner from Pure. Pure Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Did we get a one-star review this week? Nope. Not yet. There's still time. So one star's bad, I, I heard. Yeah. I was pretty excited we got a one star. But one star's bad. Yeah, yeah, five is good, I guess. I guess. I don't know. But I like the one stars. I like reading those. Yeah, it is interesting why people don't like this. Yeah. And then they, they feel bad like it. So then they then they retract it. <laughs> I didn't really need it. But it hurts the show and we'll probably go off the air if, <laughs> if, there's, if there's a one Yeah, star. quit promoting that, will you? You think he's like savvy when he goes to parties? Is I that think what so. he's talking That's about? What he's, he's just like you. <laughs> He's like, hey, baby. <laughs> so, Chris, he's down, uh, you know, at, um, what, what, what's that in Austin, Texas? That little place where they have all the... Um, South by Southwest? Food, 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 food trucks. Wow, never been to Austin, so I don't know. Oh, yeah, he's going down to the food trucks. He's, yeah. He's little, Can you imagine? He's, he's savvy he, socially. He, he goes into a bar. He goes, hey, baby. <laughs> Got uh, and got to see the new Apple. Yeah. He's yeah, he's tech, he's tech savvy, <laughs> and he's social savvy. Yeah, right. He's got it all dialed in. He's talking to a podcast. So Chris is down. He's at the the food trucks, having a couple cocktails, being very socially savvy. He's got all kinds of women sitting at his table. I have a feeling by social savvy, he means like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. That's I, think I think it's more fun to think of it. <laughs> I know. I think he's at some cocktail parties. Have you been being, being very socially savvy? <laughs> that's, how we're, that's how I take it. 